everyone, I am here and it is WrestleMania season. We are getting ever so close to the big show. Just a few weeks away and I have a few projects and videos lined up for you guys. First of all, latest episode of Weekday Warriors of Wrestling dropped last week. Go check that out. Eric and I are planning on doing more episodes as we head closer to WrestleMania, talking about the big show and also doing our own WrestleMania retrospective where we review old WrestleMania cards, something that we've has been a bit of a tradition with us, so uh, that'll be fun to do, talking about old WrestleMania. Manias. It's uh, tis the season, as it were. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. I'll have a link to the Weekday Warriors of Wrestling channel and um, a link to the email address that you can send your questions to for um, uh, fan question and answer segments that we're doing on the show. So all of that will be in the description down below. Um, additionally, uh, non-wrestling related things. Um, the book is coming along and... Once WrestleMania has come and gone, um, I can start doing some video announcements on the book, updates to the book, and, you know, showing off the cover, and announcing who wrote the foreword, things like that. A lot of fun stuff to talk about. We are getting ever so close um, to publication time. Again, I was shooting for late summer, early fall. It looks like we're going to hit that. Uh, again, fingers crossed. Hopefully everything goes uh, well. I can say that... Editing on Volume 1 is nearly complete, and editing on Volume 2 has begun, and that one should not take as long as Volume 1 has. Volume 1, um, again, kind of flying by the seat of my pants trying to figure all of this stuff out, but I'm learning more as I go along and managing to get... Uh, certain tasks done much quicker, but Volume 1 and 2 will be published at, at around the same time. I might release Volume 1 first, give it a couple weeks, and then drop Volume 2, uh, but the goal is to get everything released before the new Godzilla movie comes out in November, kind of capitalizing on Godzilla season uh, ramping up, so uh, you'll be getting those videos. Also, uh, Batman the Animated Series. I've wanted to do a video tribute to Batman the Animated Series in some way, shape, or form. I have not figured out a good way to do that yet. Um, I have an idea using YouTube Shorts um, to kind of review each episode of the series, but I haven't really... Um, finalize how I'm going to tackle that yet, but I definitely want to do it. You know, I think I've been talking about doing that for at least two years, but um, I'll get there. I'll get there. And of course, the baby is due in July, so that's also, you know, factoring into my schedule and it's going to eat up a lot of time for obvious reasons. But again, we'll we'll just have to play around with that and see how it all goes. Um, I know Channel Austin awesome does the Bat May videos, uh, so, and where they review one episode of Batman a day, and I think they will finish the series this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, but I don't want to, like, capitalize on that, so I'll probably wait until after their Batman is done and then kind of do my own series moving forward, um, after that. I'm not trying to steal their thunder or, uh, ape off of them or piggyback off of them or anything like that. It's just, uh, I really like that show and I want to talk about it. So I've actually, um, HBO, I found out they have the Super Friend, the entire Super Friend show. I'm considering rewatching that because I haven't watched some of that since I was a kid. And I was like, oh man, that would be fun to go back and watch. The, the Legion of Doom season and the last season with Darkseid as the main villain, I think, uh, would be a fun one to watch. But, uh, but yeah, some Batman stuff. Uh, again, I'm in the planning stages of that. I think I have an idea. Hopefully that's something I can finally get off my plate and on this channel sometime later this year, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, family life being what it is complicates things for obvious reasons, but that's where we are. Now, for wrestling, um, this video, um, I did promise one final healer face video. This will not be the last healer face video ever. I want to make that clear. Um, it's just going to be the last one for now as I'm trying to uh, accommodate all the craziness going on in my life and, and uh, kind of scheduling and making time for things. So instead of doing them regularly, which is what I was kind of doing, um, I think it would be better to just kind of do it when it tickles my fancy or when I have time. So Healer Face videos, um, uh, the subject are the Dudley Boys, and that will be tacked on at the end of this video, and that will be my last Healer Face video for a while. It's not usually how I do Healer Face videos, but given the time constraints, it's the best way I could do it. But I did want to get it out there and post it, so there you go. The end of this video will cover the Dudley Boys and discuss them, whether or not they worked better as heels or faces. So... Stay tuned for that. That's coming at the end of the video. Um, now, for WrestleMania season, uh, I have two videos that I have planned. 
One is my top 10 favorite WWE championship reigns of all time. Now, when I say WWE championship, I mean the main championship that has the lineage that goes all the way back to Buddy Rogers and Bruno San Martino and carries through to like Hulk Hogan and Stone Cold Steve Austin, John Cena, all of that fun stuff. Um, I'm going to pick out my top 10 favorite championship reigns from that title, from that title lineage and I think that'd be a fun video to do especially considering it's Wrestlemania season and that's typically one of if not the biggest WWF championship or WWE championship match of the year so I think that would be a really fun one to do nice little walk down memory lane um examining all those classic championship reigns and, and kind of give you all an idea of what I personally enjoy from uh, world title reigns and which ones uh, got me the most excited. So uh, so that one should be coming. Um, hopefully it's here by this weekend, maybe next. Uh, or uh, I'm sorry, this weekend, maybe next week. We'll see. And another one I'm planning on doing is a fantasy card. Uh, um, uh, in the past, I did the WWF WCW fantasy card. I really enjoyed making that video. It's one of my favorite videos I've ever done. And I was thinking about doing another one, but this one would be a dream card between rock and wrestling WWF and classic, like, uh, NWA, Jim Crockett promotions, um, that wrestling, Southern wrestling, a NWA. And what would a dream card look like between those two promotions? And I think that would be a fun one to do. Um, a little harder to nail down how I want the card to look. I've got the big matches thought out, but then when you get into like the mid card and lower cards, it's a little bit harder to figure out. Um, especially trying to figure out um, what year should I base this on, because with WWF versus WCW, the obvious time to do it was after WCW folded. So the best WrestleMania to do that would be the next year would be WrestleMania 18. And you know all the big players from both companies during that time period. So that one was a fairly easy card to put together. This one's a little bit tougher because we were in that age where guys, some guys were going back and forth between the two, like Ricky Steamboat. Dusty Rhodes ended up in WWF by 1989. And... Um, Picking the right year to kind of make that dream card happen is also uh, kind of interesting. Obviously, we all know what the main event would be. It's Hogan and Flair. But what year do you do Hogan Flair where it's at its best, where both men are at their peak? I would argue 1989, is, or like 88, 89 is probably the year where both of them were at their best. Um, Hogan was doing... Uh, banger box office, uh, you know, when you look at WrestleMania 5 and SummerSlam, uh, it, was, it was one of his hottest years. And Ric Flair obviously had the feud with Terry Funk in the, the trilogy of matches with Ricky Steamboat, uh, arguably having the best year of his celebrated and storied Hall of Fame career. But uh, is that the best time to do a Hogan Flair match? I don't know. Uh, so again, trying to figure all of that stuff out was what uh, kind of the tricky part. But I should have that video up before WrestleMania as well. So um, I think that is it as far as channel updates go. I think I've rambled long enough about that. So um, now before I get into the heel or face portion of this video that brings up what the main topic of this video is going to be, I've decided that I'm going to go ahead and give my thoughts and predictions on the WrestleMania 39 card. Um, you know, a few weeks out, because it looks like, I mean, I've pretty much got an idea of what the final card is going to be. There may be a couple more matches added in, but for right now, I think we have all the big matches pretty much laid out. So I'm going to give my thoughts and predictions on the card. Uh, we don't know what's going to be on one night exactly. I think we can assume that Cody and Roman is going to be the main event of night two. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, I think they've already got Seth and Logan Paul slated for night one. Um, but for the most part, we don't know where a lot of this stuff is going to fall. Um, and some of the matches aren't official yet, but uh, like Ray and Dominic, which I think we all know is going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if they did something where Ray and Dominic is not official until night one of WrestleMania, and that's when Ray finally breaks. Where he's like, okay, you know what? I've had it. Oh, fine. I'll fight you at WrestleMania. Night two, get your boots on. And I wouldn't be surprised if they did something like that. But generally, I think we all pretty much know what is going to happen uh, with the card. Tag title match isn't set yet, but I think we all know what that's going to be. Um, but I can give my thoughts and predictions on the card, especially since there's been some... Uh, interesting news items that have broken out earlier this week that impacts the WrestleMania card directly. Uh, so I want to talk about all of that. So let's go into the matches that are already official. 
Uh, we have the six-woman tag team match, Trish Stratus, Lita, and Becky Lynch. Uh, Lita and Becky Lynch being the women's tag team champions. Taking on Damage Control, Bailey, Dakota Kai, and Io Sky. This is a fun attraction match. It's a fun Legends match. Let Lita and Trish... Um, have like a feel good match, and uh, I, I would imagine the baby faces would win this. I will say that Lita did not look great in the match where her and Becky won the tag titles, um, but hopefully, with you know two extra bodies in there, that'll help hide that. Uh, she did hit the moonsault, which the, I, I remember the last time I saw her trying to do the moonsault, she almost didn't get over all the way, and I was like, please stop doing the moonsault. You're risking life and limb here <laughs> for no reason. Um, but this one will just be kind of a feel good match to make the fans happy, so uh, I would imagine the faces would win that one. We've got uh, two women's championship matches, neither of which I'm overly excited about, to be perfectly honest. Uh, we've got Charlotte Flair defending the SmackDown women's title against Rhea Ripley, and the reason I'm not excited about this one is Charlotte does not work as a baby face, like, at all. Spoiler alert for my future healer face video on Charlotte Flair. She works better as a heel. It's just everything about her demeanor, her posture, everything just screams heel. And them trying to force a round or a square peg into a round hole with her and making her a baby face just makes no sense to me. Because she does not fit that role at all whatsoever. And it's not great. So um, hopefully Rhea wins. Um, and that's it. Like, yeah, it's like, that's really all I have to say. As long as Rhea wins, there'll be no problem. I would be shocked if Charlotte walked out with the belt. Because. Um, Rhea's got way more momentum, and Charlotte is just remarkably uninteresting, especially as a face. So I, I would put the belt on Rhea. That would be my pick. Uh, the other one is for the Raw Women's title, Bianca Belair defending against Asuka. No real storyline here. It's just kind of like, oh, they're just doing a title match. I'm sure it'll be good. I mean, it's, you know, I, I trust those two women as capable talents and workers, but I just, the... the there's not much of a story here. It just feels like a match that's happening, and they keep reminding us that it's happening, and that's the whole depth of the storyline. But it uh, should be, you know, as, as like a basic title defense. It should be a good one. Um, I would imagine that Asuka would win the title here. That would be my expectation. But, uh, again, we shall see. Uh, we've got... Uh, Austin Theory defending the United States title against John Cena, a match that got set up last week on Raw with uh, Cena putting down Austin Theory, saying that they pipe in crowd noises because nobody really cares about him. Of course, me being the John Cena hater that I was for years, I pointed out, it's like, piping in crowd noises was like your thing for... I mean, it became a normal practice while you were there on top. Um, which pay-per-view was it? I think it was Royal Rumble 06 when he beat Edge for the belt. Didn't they pipe in, like, a reaction to a Stone Cold Steve Austin championship win over Cena's championship win because people were booing that he won the title. <laughs> it was, I mean, it's such a thing. It's like, dude, it became standard practice while you were around and you're burying Austin Theory for it. Um, I mean, it's a big match because John's matches are all big now because he doesn't wrestle as much and he's a lot more palatable when he's not on TV every week. Uh, it, I mean, it's much better than it was back in the days when he was on every week and just dominated the shows. At least, I still don't like him, but at least now he's a special attraction, and I can, like, I can handle him. <laughs> like, it's, I'm not, like, uh, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm being force-fed John Cena every single episode, and, um, I would imagine Theory would retain. I, I'm not the biggest fan of Austin Theory, I'm just, I'm not, I, I, I don't see it in him, at least not yet. He hasn't really clicked with me yet. Um, that could change at some point, but right now he's just, he's just... Douchebag McJerk face, and that's all he is. There's nothing unique or interesting about him beyond just, yeah, he's got a punchable face. He, you know, I get that, but um, he's just, he's white Sammy Guevara. That's basically what he is, and I, I don't know, but it's a big match for him, and I would imagine he would go over here, or at least keep the U.S. title, because I can't imagine John Cena keep it, winning the U.S. title here and then disappearing from TV. It just wouldn't make much sense. So, uh, yeah, it's a big match for Theory, and I would imagine he would take the W here. Man, what a year he's had, because last year he was the guy losing to Pat McAfee and getting obliterated by Stone Cold Steve Austin, and getting shown up by Vince McMahon, who did better against Pat McAfee than he did, and now here he is, it looks like he's going to beat John Cena at WrestleMania, which admittedly is not as 
big a deal as it once was because Undertaker destroyed him, Bray Wyatt destroyed him at 36, you know, so that victory over Cena doesn't seem like as big of a deal now, but um, but it's a big deal for Theory considering his placement where he's not a top tier star yet. And speaking of Bray Wyatt, I will get into that, don't you worry. Um, and then we have Edge versus Finn Balor in a Hell in a Cell match. Is that good? That could be the main event for night one. I mean, it's a Hell in a Cell match. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that Edge and Finn Balor is the most exciting or d dynamic feud of all time, but it's at least a feud, one that has built up going back to last year, and one that it's more worthy of the Hell in a Cell match than a majority of Hell in a Cell matches today. So, um... And what have I been saying for years? Ever since they did the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, they've completely devalued uh, what that match is supposed to mean. And this is actually closer to what that match is supposed to mean. The Cody-Seth match helped remind people. It's like, this is what the Hell in a Cell match is supposed to be like. Uh, I still don't like the idea of Hell in a Cell matches without color. I think, you know, matches like Steel Cages and War Games and Hell in a Cell and even Elimination Chamber, like, benefit from color to sell the danger of the structure. Uh, and when you don't have that, I think it, it kind of softens the blow for a lot of these matches. But it, it'll probably be a really good match. I would imagine Edge would win here as kind of like a final, you know, babyface triumphs. But then again, he won in February uh, in that match, and I didn't think he was going to. So, um, so maybe they had him win in February so that Finn could win... Uh, at WrestleMania, so maybe they'll do that. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and pick Finn to win, but I wouldn't be surprised if Edge won either. Uh, then we have this match I'm looking forward to, uh, an Intercontinental title match, Triple Threat. Um, or it looks like it's going to be a triple threat. I would imagine, given what happened on SmackDown last week, that the match is going to get turned into a triple threat. But Gunther defending the Intercontinental Championship against Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. Um, yeah, they're, they're just going to go out there and stiff the holy hell out of each other. I'm completely okay with that. I think that could be a lot of fun. And it could be like... Um, I mean, Sheamus and Gunther had the, the match at Clash of the Castle last year that was, you know, everyone loved it. And I'm thinking back to when I first started watching New Japan and you had Togi Makabe and um, Tomohiro Ishii having those stiff fests for the Never Open Weight title. That's kind of what this feels like and what it's probably going to be. And I'm, I'm all here for it. I think that's fantastic. So, um... I'm going to pick Gunther to retain the title because I think uh, they've made a big deal about him being the longest reigning intercontinental champion of the 21st century, and I think they view him possibly Hunter, is, is Triple H is thinking this, views Gunther as a potential candidate to break the streak of the Honky Tonk Man, which it's amazing to me that Honky Tonk stayed has stayed as the longest reigning inter intercontinental champion for as long as he has, like, because Demolition's tag team record has been broken twice now, um, you know, and Bruno's record, uh, I mean, that one will never be beat, it's just, it, there's no way, like, the fact that Roman's held the belt as long as he has is pretty amazing, but, um, it's just, of all the ones that have lasted, it's amazing that Honky Tonk Man's is one of the ones that has stayed, as he's the longest reigning inter intercontinental champion of all time, it's kind of amazing, uh, you would have thought that, like, whether it be The Rock, or whether it be, um, like, I don't know, like like a Chris Jericho or or Shawn Michaels or someone. Razor Ramon would be another one. Like, you would think it would have been one of those that would be the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion. But no, it's the Honky Tonk Man. And I think they view Gunther as a potential candidate to ultimately break that record and make him the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion. So I will pick him to win. And... And that leads me into uh, everybody's favorite match that, that everybody on the internet lost their mind for when it was signed, uh, Brock Lesnar versus Omos. And this also ties into the Bray Wyatt discussion, but it also um, <clears throat> ties into Gunther a little bit, uh, so I guess I'll just talk about this now. Brock Lesnar versus Omos, uh, not a lot of people were happy when they signed this match, myself included. Um, I would have been fine if they did it at Elimination Chamber and then did Lashley versus Brock at WrestleMania. I think that's a better usage of pretty much everybody involved. Because almost, I get it. He looks huge, he's seven feet tall, and he looks amazing. Um, Talent-wise, you know, I mean, he's better than Kali, but I'll give him that. He's better than Kali. But he's the type of guy that, if he were around in the 80s, he would have been... 
main eventing with Hogan on house shows, but probably not at a WrestleMania or a SummerSlam or, or some bi or a Saturday Night's Main. Well, maybe a Saturday Night's Main event, but uh, but that type of thing. He's like, yeah, you're fine to use in these like spectacle matches, um, uh, but you don't work as like a long term solution or like a major major contender for the world championship. He looks great, and you can put him in spectacle like situations. And I think a match with Lesnar will be fun because Lesnar will probably just toss almost around. Um, the match probably won't go longer than two or three minutes, and Lesnar will just look like a beast tossing around a giant, kind of like his, as a throwback to his matches with Big Show. And there's a certain appeal to that. I don't know if it's like... I, I kind of look at it as... It's kind of, it kind of reminds me of WrestleMania 19, where Undertaker was... I mean, you look at that whole card. You've got Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho, the return of Wrestle, uh, the return of Mr. WrestleMania to WrestleMania, uh, Hogan McMahon, Austin Rock in the final encounter. You've got um, Triple H versus Booker for the world title. You've got um, uh, Angle and Lesnar in the main event, and you've got all these big matches. And it's like, what's Undertaker doing? Hey, he's working a tag match with A Train and Big Show and this newcomer. That's not very good. It's like, really? That's all you came up with for Undertaker? And then the match got the rug pulled out from under it on the day of the show because they determined that Nathan Jones sucks. <laughs> so they had to make a handicap match, and it was like, man, that's all you had for Taker? You kind of did him dirty that year. Did he draw the short straw? Like, what happened there? And <laughs> uh, that's kind of what this feels like, where it's like, that's all you had for Lesnar, really? That's all you could think of? And I'm going to defend it to a certain degree, because there were other options for matches that they could do with Brock. And I'm sure somebody probably proposed Brock versus Gunther, especially after the Royal Rumble and the reaction that their interaction had. I totally get that. Except I think they looked at the situation as like, look, we want Brock to go over at WrestleMania. But we also want Gunther to potentially tease or absolutely do it and break the Intercontinental title record and have the longest reign. And, um, you know, if you put Brock and Gunther at WrestleMania together, you kind of ruin that. So it's like, okay, so either Brock loses or Gunther loses his Intercontinental title run that we're trying to turn into a potential record breaker. And it's like, okay, um, let's not do this at this WrestleMania. Maybe let's save that for WrestleMania 40. We'll see how it goes. And we'll come back to that match later. Uh, some people were proposing Brock versus Bray. I have a funny feeling that Brock nicks that because Bray Wyatt is kind of a black hole right now, creatively. Like, he drags everything down with him. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about Bray. Trust me, I'm getting there. And, uh, I, you know, there's been speculation that Brock just absolutely said no to the match. That's entirely possible. Uh, you know, he also nixed the match with Jinder Mahal. He made the absolute right call because Jinder sucks. <laughs> and he wanted to work with AJ, which is much better. <laughs> and um, uh, Brock was absolutely right with that one. So I think they looked at this situation. And again, you know, Brock and Bray, it's like, all right, who goes over there? Because we want Brock to win. Uh, but Bray, it's like, can we afford to have him you know, lose another WrestleMania and kill his mystique, his his mystique that I think he's lost already despite not losing, but be that as it may, uh, uh, all right, so they probably figured, okay, we can't do the Bray match. So I think they looked at the situation, it's like, well, I guess Omos is the only one we can throw at him, and, it, you know, Brock can go over and not hurt anybody, because Omos isn't going to be world champion, I think we all know that, but he can have a fun little spectacle match with Brock. Now, we're all get mad at WWE for making a mistake. I think it should have been Lashley and Brock at Mania. I think that was the more exciting match. I think you could have done um, Brock and almost in February and then done Brock and Lashley at WrestleMania. Or do the match in February between Brock and Lashley and then do a, some kind of a gimmick rematch at WrestleMania, given that their last match ended with a disqualification. That would have made the most sense to me, but they didn't do that, so... Whoopsie daisies. Um, so that was the mistake they made. And uh, again, going back to the you know potential Brock and Gunther match, I have criticized WWE in the past for doing putting themselves into situations where it's like, well, if you didn't want so and so to lose and you had to keep the belt on somebody else, why would you even book this match in the first place? Like uh, the Fiend and Seth Rollins. I looked at that match. It's like, okay, well, Fiend has to win the title. It's too soon, but you can't kill him now. And then we got what we got. And it wasn't great. Uh, we all know how bad that was. And it's like, 
And I'm sure they felt like, well, we were booked into a corner. It's like, no, you weren't. You didn't have to do the match. No one forced you to do the match. So I understand them not doing Brock and Gunther. I understand them not doing Brock and Bray. Um, but I feel like Brock and Lashley would have been a better option all around. I think people would have gotten more excited for that match. And Lashley's already beaten Lesnar in the past, so you have a built-in story there. Um, that one would have made more sense to me. And, uh, you know, Brock is going to go over against Omos. We all know that. Uh, I would be surprised if he didn't. And uh, Lashley is, uh, well, was stuck working with Bray, and I guess that leads me into this fiasco where poor Lashley gets stuck working with... Bray Wyatt, who is not working, hasn't been working, um, you know, when he first returned, we all went nuts, and we're like, okay, third time's a charm, you know, they botched the, uh, the Deliverance character for the Wyatt family, they botched the Fiend, it's like, okay, now Bray's back, let's see what they do. I, I am not a fan of this Uncle Howdy stuff. It's not working. The Pitch Black match with LA Knight did not work. And every time he's on TV, I tune out. Because it's just not interesting, and it's not fun. It's not engaging. It feels like... And the comparison I've heard online, and I'm going to use it here. This feels like when Ultimate Warrior was in WCW. Where it's like, look, this once cool, energetic character is now seems to he almost seems out of place on this show and i don't know if it's his creative i don't know if it's bad creative from other people i i don't know what it is but this bray wyatt character and this uncle howdy thing it's just not working right now and that's the unfortunate truth of the situation it feels like poor lashley got stuck with a dead angle heading into wrestlemania but then it broke that Russell, uh, that um, Bray Wyatt missed a house show in MSG, and the current story online is that there's a physical issue with Bray, and that's what's keep, keeping him off WWE programming for right now, and his status for WrestleMania is currently unknown, which leaves um, Lashley kind of without a dance partner. It's like, man, I really, really wish you had... <laughs> just save the Brock and Lashley match for WrestleMania. Like, this match, the Lashley-Bray match is more offensive to me than Omos and Brock. Because at least Omos and Brock, it's like, okay, it will be a fun match just to see Brock throw around a seven-foot guy. That at least works to some degree. Um, Lashley and Bray, I don't see them as good dance partners at all. I don't think it would work. And Bray's not working regardless of who you put him with. So it just feels like whoever, whoever Bray works with, it just feels like a black hole that they get trapped in. Um, L.A. Knight dug himself out of it and seems to be, I mean, there's rumors going around that he could be facing Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania. Um, if that happens, it'll probably be like a two-minute match where Austin just stuns and gets a three-count, drinks some beer, and that's it. I, I would prefer it if they didn't do that. I feel like the match with Owens was a good send-off for him. And I think trying to do like the Austin Legends match every year at WrestleMania now would kind of kill that and make it less special. And I'd rather they just come up with something different for L.A. Knight, but that's just me. Uh, but right now, he's kind of settled into the role where he is the, um, the, the twerp heel that gets his ass kicked all the time. Which, you know, the Simon Dean role, if it were, if, if you will. And, um, yeah, I mean, there are, you know, you can make a career off of that, I guess. And he's really good on the mic, so I'm sure there's plenty of things for him to do. But, um... Yeah, LA Knight and Austin, I mean, people will pop for Austin because it's Austin, but I, I'm not overly excited about that. So I'm looking at the card. What else? Oh, and there's also um, uh, Rey Mysterio versus Dominic, which is pretty much a given that it's going to happen at this point. The first father versus, well, second father versus son match. That's right, because Vince and Shane faced each other at WrestleMania 17. But uh, it's a shame we never got David and Bruno in an angle. That could have worked, but... <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a hell of a match. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, I, I mean, the angle that they've done here, I think it's a really good, well-done story. And Dominic's kind of won me over. Um, you know, initially I was like, ugh, I don't care about this twerp. And then they just leaned into him being a twerp, this prison-tough gimmick, and this hateable little douchebag. And it's like, oh, my God, I love Dominic now. He's, he's fantastic. What a little asshole. And I, I think it's a natural match to have at WrestleMania. There was some talk that it would be a tag match. I prefer to keep it one-on-one, -on -one, but that's me. And uh, we'll see how all of that goes. But that should be a really exciting one. I would, I would expect Ray to go over, but we'll see. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how all that plays out. But I'm going to pick Ray to go over because Dominic is such a twerp that 
him getting the win uh, or, or Ray beating him would be so satisfying in many ways. And uh, but they could also just have uh, Dominic retire Ray and then just kind of run with that post WrestleMania. So there's a lot of different ways they could go. But for right now, I'm picking Ray to go over, kind of Undertaker Kane style, where it's like. He's, he doesn't want to fight, he doesn't want to fight, he doesn't want to fight, and then when he does, he comes through and wins. So, uh, there is that. Uh, then we've got Seth Rollins versus Logan Paul. That should be a crazy match, given the athletic prowess of both men. I would anticipate Seth would go over in that match, but it should be a lot of fun. Um, and... I think I've got just about everything. Um, yeah, I think so. And then, of course, there's the main event. Oh, tag title match. I, that's the other one I forgot. Tag title match. We all know it's going to be based on Jay's big turn that happened uh, last week on Raw. We know where this is going. It's going to be Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens versus the Usos for the tag titles. Uh, should be an exciting match. Uh, you know, I already talked about Edge and Balor possibly main eventing night one. I would not be surprised if the tag title match got that spot. Um, I think it would be a great way to go. I also think it's a nice way to kind of have, like, bloodline main event both nights and um, have one main event play into the storyline of the other. I think there's a lot of different ways they can go with that. Um, I would expect Sammy and Kevin Owens to win the titles and put doubt on whether or not Roman will win the next night. Uh, that's what I'm thinking, but they can very well just make a double main event out of it and just do it on night two, just do both matches back to back. They might do that. Uh, who knows? But I've even had the idea maybe night one they do... Bloodline versus Cody, KO, and Sammy as like in a six-man tag is like a preview, kind of like what New Japan does with some of their multi-night cards, and just do a six-man tag and then do both matches the next night on night two. They got, like I said, they have options to kind of play with this a little bit. But I anticipate Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn to win the tag titles here, so we'll see how all that plays out. But I do think, uh, regardless of how the tag title match plays out, I do think Sami Zayn has to play some kind of a role in the main event of Cody and Roman, and I'll go into that right now. So Cody Rhodes going after Roman Reigns, and I've gone back and forth on who was going to win this match, and they put the they planted the seed. I've talked about record breaking. Uh, they planted the seed for Roman making it to a thousand days as champion. Um, and do they want him to get to the thousand days, or do you have Cody be the one to stop him before he gets there? It's like, mm, you could go either way. I don't know. And it's always more exciting when you don't know, because there's plenty of ways they can go with this. But if Roman is losing the belt at WrestleMania, I think Sammy has to play some kind of a role in that, whether it be stopping the Usos from interfering or stopping Roman from cheating or, or something. He has to play some kind of role in in Roman's downfall, similar to Mick Foley at WrestleMania 15, when he was the special guest referee that counted down the Rock's shoulders so that Steve Austin could win back the championship. So um, I'm very interested in seeing how this match plays out. I think it's going to be a very, very good one. Uh, Cody's promo on Raw this week was lit. <laughs> that thing was exciting. And uh, yeah, I legitimately don't know who's going to win that. I, I'm going to pick Cody. Because that's kind of where my gut is right now. But I would not be surprised if Roman Reigns won. Again, for the sole purpose of getting him to a 1,000 days. But a lot of different ways they could go with this. It is very exciting. And I can't wait to see how it all plays out. So those are my thoughts on the WrestleMania 39 two-night card. Again, I overall... I think there's some fun attractions on there. It's not a card that I'm, like, absolutely enamored with or in love with, but there's some really good stuff on there, and they've actually... There's some long-term stories heading into the show. When you look at Ray and Dominic, Edge and Finn, um, Roman and Cody, uh, the tag title match that is all but certain to be signed to this card, um, Gunther Sheamus and Drew McIntyre. I mean, there's a lot of, like long, well-thought-out stories heading into the show. And, and not everything is great, obviously, but it's one of their better-built cards in a while. I, I'll give them that. And it's uh, I think this could be a really fun show. I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. So we'll see how WWE does with their two-night WrestleMania that goes Hollywood. I will say this. The parody trailers that they've done are nowhere near as good as they were in 2005. Like, not even close. The Top Gun one was terrible. The Titanic one I didn't get. And, um, I guess the Joker one was okay until it became, until Becky Lynch started acting like Batman, then it just got weird and awkward. Um, 
And then the Stranger Things one, I, I didn't even realize it was Stranger Things parody at first. I thought it was like a, a preview package for the Rhea Charlotte match, which I guess it kind of was. But I was like, oh, oh, it's a Stranger Things thing. I didn't even realize that at first. I was like, why is John Cena talking to Rhea Ripley? I don't know what's going on there. But uh, the movie parodies for 2005's WrestleMania 21 were much better, significantly better. I, I still remember them to this day. Undertaker's Dirty Harry. Um, when Harry Met Sally with Kurt Angle and Christy Hemme, um, the Taxi Driver one, You Talking to Me, all classic. The Forrest Gump one with Eugene, classic. Um, the Braveheart one with Triple H. They're all so good, and all these ones just kind of suck and have just fallen flat. I don't know what's going on, but it's a shame. It's a shame, but uh, I think the card will be better than the movie parodies. That I do know. So uh, with all that said, let's go into the Healer Face video. And the subject of this Healer Face video is the Dudley Boys, one of the greatest tag teams of all time, and I will not waste your time in analyzing it and going into great detail. The Dudley Boys work better as heels. It's just how it is. You look at their career, starting with ECW and the amount of heat that they were able to get in front of that audience, and then you look at them in WWF, WWE, and then you look at them even in TNA. Um... They just work so much better as heels, like just all around, just always, always, always. And then that's not to say the Dudleys aren't likable. They're very cool. And I think um, especially when you look at them in WWE at that time when the tag team division kind of had a renaissance where you had the Hardys and Edge and Christian and the Dudley boys all on top having these amazing TLC matches that revolutionized the business. Uh, some ways, in some ways, in very, very bad ways. But... Um, that's a discussion for another time. But they all filled like very interesting roles where it's almost like a return to classic NWA wrestling but with new modern twist where you had the Hardy Boys who were kind of like the Rock and Roll Express, the underdog high flyers and the heartthrobs that the women love. You had Edge and Christian who were kind of like the Midnight Express who were like the very talented athletic cheaters and had a little bit more of a colorful personality uh, to them than maybe some of their other opponents. And then you had uh, the Dudley Boys, who were kind of like the Road Warriors in the sense that they were the brawler types. They were the big bruiser badasses that just killed people and reveled in slamming them through tables. In, in the Road Warriors days, they reveled in bloodying people and throwing them off of scaffolds. The Dudley Boys reveled in slamming everybody through tables, uh, which... <clears throat> You know, I mean, they got so closely associated with tables that it was great for them and um, um, it really helped carve their identity as far as being a, an act in the WWF. But when you look at what they were doing, like putting women through tables, like it started with Terry Runnels. She was the first. And then they did it to Mae Young, which was still, is still to this day one of the craziest things I've ever seen on WWE programming. Um, the fact that they did that. It really helped put them over the top as these hateable, psychotic, evil heels. And that's how I like my Dudleys. I think they work better in that dynamic. Now, they worked face, especially when they worked with Edge and Christian. Um, and, and not that they were bad at it. I think you, you look at them as baby faces, and they did mostly well. Um, but they just, something about them was just more naturally suited to be heels, especially since they were bigger than the people they were working against, typically. And I think that, especially when they were working with the Hardys, I think it just, the heel face dynamic just worked much better that way when the Dudleys were heels. And their matches were much, much better. I mean, you look at Royal Rumble 2000 and that table match that they had. I mean, I still think that's the best tables match of all time. And um, that match worked because the Dudley boys are great, great heels. And, um, you know, when they were baby faces, again, their matches weren't bad, but they kind of settled, they were one of the guys, and Rob Van Dam kind of fell into this too, where they settled into a routine where they just had the same match every week on TV, sometimes twice in one week because they wrestled on Raw and SmackDown. And it's like, all right, you know you're going to see the was up bomb. You know you're going to see Devon get the table. You know you're going to see yada, yada, yada. Yeah, I could set my watch to a, a baby-faced Dudley Boys match, but when they were heels, a little bit more... 
assholeish, and they could be a little bit more creative, and that was um, um, a, a better use of their talents, I feel like. And again, kind of the same thing in TNA, where when they first came in, it was exciting. It's like, ooh, look at this big signing we got, um, and added to the TNA roster. It's like, oh, that's cool. But then after a while, it's kind of like, eh, you know, they're kind of suck-ups, and always talk about how they respect the fans, which is not how I like my Dudleys. And there are other teams I like more, like Beer Money and Motor City Machine Guns and LAX and Team Canada and yada, 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 all those other things. And it's like, eh, there's a few I like more. But then you make the Dudley boys heel and have them go up against the X Division and work against the Motor City Machine Guns and um, those type of things. I think they fit that role much, much better. They just work better as heels. And um, that's especially true of Bubba Ray, Bully Ray, who I think if you listen to him in interviews, he's kind of naturally a prick. And I think that carries over much better to his wrestling persona when he's just being himself and just being a complete and utter asshole. And, you know, we can knock TNA for a lot of the things that they did, but I think giving a singles main event run to... Um, Bully Ray and making him world champion during that whole Aces and Eights angle, which that's a whole other discussion in of itself. Aces and Eights, it's like I'm so torn on that angle because there's aspects of it that I loved, one of them being Bully Ray, and there's aspects of it that I didn't love so much, so I'm kind of torn on it, but uh, the stuff that worked really, really worked, and I think Bully Ray being the head of it was the thing that really, really worked. And... Uh, again, it's just him being an asshole prick heel. And I, I've started re-watching Impact lately, where he's on the show and feuding with Tommy Dreamer, which, let's be honest, not a whole lot of people care about that. But he's kind of, you know, he he gets heat, and he's an asshole. It feels natural to him, and he disrespects Mickey James and all this other stuff. And it's just, it's the role he was born to play. You can't, you don't want that guy as a a suck-up baby face. And I think that that's true of the Dudley boys as a tag team. Whenever they were a baby face, even though they could get over his faces, eventually they would devolve into kind of boring suck-up baby faces. And I think being heel just kind of suited them more naturally. And so that's why there really wasn't much of a debate here when they won the poll to be the subject of the heel or face video. Even though they did switch heel and face quite a few times. They were almost like the tag team version of the big show. But um, they just, they're a much more natural fit as heels, I think. And I don't think a whole lot of people are going to disagree with me on that one.